Oh, Yohach. Anshak Haiwishka. Good morning. My name is Fawn Sharp. I serve as president of the Cornell Indian Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. I am so happy and honored to be invited to provide these remarks. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for the partnership and, and thank you for the leadership. Uh, on behalf of the Cornell Nation, I just want to also say that this is a time and a moment that we seriously and honorably are, are so happy that we can uh, join the state of Washington any time that we uh, have an opportunity to uh, to chart a path and a new course of, of, of leadership to meet today's challenges to rise above so much that's happening in this world and join partners uh, all throughout our region it's truly an honor so thank you uh, this means a lot to me uh, I've been telling folks a lot lately uh, that we live in apocalyptic times I've been saying that for, for over a decade now with regard to climate change, and those of us that have been working on climate change for years have long seen that this is an apocalyptic crisis that's a slow-moving crisis. It's, it's moving at glacial speed, but yet it's uh, significantly profound and has a tremendous impact on the lives of everyday people, uh, not only here in the Northwest, across the country, but globally. No one is immune from climate change. We are all deeply impacted by climate change. Some may not even realize it yet, but there is a, a glacial tsunami that is moving in our direction and it's been moving for, for many years. And I would like to make this point that what we see on the surface in today's world, the wildfires that are burning, even in this very moment across the West, with the hurricanes and the tornadoes and all of the impacts that we see, a global pandemic, all of these are simply symptoms of a much deeper imbalance. And that deeper imbalance didn't happen just this last year in 2020. It didn't happen a decade ago. It didn't happen a lifetime ago. It began centuries ago. In, in native tribes, tribal nations throughout uh, here in the Northwest, across the country, and quite frankly, around the world, have long known that there's a day of reckoning, and a day of reckoning is coming. And we are at that point. Our generation is facing the most important and significant crisis that any generation has faced, because we are at that point where we are rapidly approaching a tipping point. And uh, I know that with the work that's happening throughout here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, with our tribal nations and our partners, we are gonna seize this moment. There's no question that we are running out of time. I've long had a sense of urgency. I here at the Quinault Nation have seen the impacts of climate change firsthand. I got elected in 2006. I'm only the ninth president since the turn of the last century. And I've had an opportunity to sit with elders. I've had an opportunity to sit and talk with our fishermen who fished on the ocean and on our rivers throughout their lifetime. They've heard stories, they've had oral tradition uh, about our fishing practices passed down generation after generation. And it, it is the elders and, and the generation of fishermen today that uh, really uh, drew me to this issue. Uh, I grew up here uh, in the state of Washington during the height of the fishing wars, the bull era of the Pacific Northwest. And I knew as a young child the value of what our fishery has meant to not only our community, but tribal nations all across this region. The prized sockeye blueback salmon that returns to the mighty Quinault only comes to our area. In the 1950s and 60s, we had millions of sockeye return to the mighty Quinault River, millions. And we have a graph that shows over time how, how uh, millions of sockeye just plummeted. The year I got elected, we only had 3,000. Last year, we only harvested 27 sockeye, and we've had to close our fisheries for three years in a row. So when fishermen talk to me about this crisis, I, of course, did what tribal nations always do when we're facing these type of crises. We reach out for best and new and emerging science to try to figure out what's going on, and we let science drive our public policy decisions. I, I am so very uh, happy and, and, and proud of the work that our tribal fishery staff have been able to do at the Northwest Indian Fish Commission in every tribal nation that has a fisheries department. And so they briefed me and I learned about things like ocean acidification. 
I learned about the warming ocean temperatures and they showed me a graph where it, with each decline of our fisheries from the 1950s to now, if you did an overlay of the warming ocean temperature, there was a direct alignment. So I knew and understood what ocean acidification meant, what warming temperatures meant. And I was also brief that we have glaciers that feed the Quinault, four glaciers, and one of them has been rapidly receding. Well, I had asked to, I wanted to personally take a look at that glacier. So with our team, uh, with our scientists and our photographers, I, uh, we took a helicopter flight. As I came over the ridge to look at the Anderson Glacier, my heart nearly sank because I didn't see a glacier. I just saw a, a, what looked like a mud puddle on the side of a mountain, a large mud puddle. It was muddy, it was murky, there was no sheen, there was no glacier. And so uh, to come face to face, to understand and recognize the impacts of climate change, to come right up to a mountain and, and expect to see a glacier and see nothing. And I, as, as I made the trip back, um, the, I, I can tell you this, the helicopter flight back was somber. Uh, we were all without words. We, there was, what can you say? Uh, but my thoughts went to, went to those years during my childhood when I, I knew the value of what our surprise sockeye meant to the Quinault people. I, I thought of the fight and, and everything that the leaders that have gone before me, the elders, all of those who have fought so hard to protect our salmon, everything that we've given, the, the expense of litigation, the expense of the fight, and to now see macro environmental impacts that are at the point of completely wiping out everything that we fought for, completely wiping out our identity, completely wiping out uh, those things that, that mean so much to us culturally, for our ceremonies, for our tribal journeys, for our weddings, for our funerals, all of those things that uh, intertwine the prized sockeye blueback salmon to our community. And, and it's unthinkable and unconscionable that that's a possibility that in our generation, we can be that generation that sees the last blueback salmon return to the mighty Quinault. It's, it's unthinkable. And, and so I thought to myself, there is no way. I do not want another generation to pass where we continue to see this decline. We have to do something. We have to fight to protect our prized sockeye salmon. And so I began to engage in climate discussions back in 2006, and it was tough. It was very difficult. I remember being in meetings, whether it was a tribal meeting, a state meeting, or even a meeting with our trustee and our federal partners, I would raise the issue of climate change, the room would get quiet, and then somebody would change the subject. It was very difficult to, to directly engage and have any meaningful dialogue and discussion around climate change at that time. I, I just remember it seemed like it was such a large issue. There was still a great uh, bit of denial that there's there's not a problem with climate change. So we went outside of the United States. In, in 2009, I, I began to work internationally. Uh, actually, uh, probably 2007-8, I started working internationally. 2009, I went to uh, the UN uh, Conference of Parties, COP14. It was in Poznan, on Poland. It was an exciting time. Uh, President Obama had just been elected, had not yet been sworn in. And so there was a great hope and sense of uh, what is the United States going to do? Is the United States going to step up and, and begin to be an active and engaged uh, partner on climate change? And so it was a time when we were able to really work with international partners. And I began to realize that the value of doing climate work is not only in the science part of it and protecting our natural resources, but I also began to understand that in managing uh, over a 200,000 acre forested reservation that if we extend our rotation of our trees, we can take not only the industrial model of manning, managing our forests and, and uh, cutting, planting, thinning, harvesting trees in a 30-year cycle, we can actually extend the rotation, sequester carbon, put that into the market, and if we manufacture green certified wood, we can also uh, have another revenue stream. So Rather than just one revenue stream with an industrial model, we could have a pre-harvest revenue stream with carbon sequestration, and we could have uh, the revenues that come with harvesting our trees, but then also uh, we could produce green certified wood and have a post-harvest revenue stream. So I, I begin to understand the value of, of creating a new economy, if you will. How can we take what was done in the past and 
uh, apply new and emerging science and technology to, to further expand uh, our economic diversity and, and bring about change. And so I, I started to look around. Uh, at the time, there were only three voluntary systems in the United States on carbon sequestration. There was a system in California, uh, the Chicago Climate Exchange, and then there was one in New England. Well, the domestic market was only trading at two to three dollars a metric ton at the time, and the international market was trading at thirty-two dollars a metric ton. And I found out the reason domestic companies couldn't access those markets was because the U.S. was not a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. However, uh, I was able to uh, secure a legal opinion that notwithstanding the fact the United States is not a signatory, that does not preclude a tribal nation from entering the international market on, on carbon sequestration. And so I managed to pull uh, tribes together through the, the affiliated tribes in the Northwest Indians. We had a resolution supporting uh, this type of approach to our economy. I had tribal nations here in the Pacific Northwest and a couple uh, in Canada that my colleagues have been working with. And so the, the footprint that we put together was larger than some European countries. And so I went to Poznan, uh, Poland to hopefully open up some dialogue and engagement with those outside of the United States, not only on climate policy, but the new exciting and emerging economic opportunities. And that was in my, my first term in office. And I, I remember being so excited about the prospects of doing what we can uh, under a new presidency, a new, new chapter. And I had, I had spent a, a, at that point about 10 years uh, studying uh, international human rights law. I was well aware of the work that was happening in the international community with regard to the rights of indigenous peoples. I had been active at that point in, in working on climate change for about um, three years. And so I was, I was ready. I was ready to, uh, to step out and, and truly engage in, in public policy and building a new economy at that time. Well, when I arrived, it was, it was quite, um, uh, I, I had mixed feelings because the, the welcoming and the reception from those who were there uh, wanting to advance the U.S. position seemed to have a, a, a significant disconnect between uh, what they had in terms of a vision and what the European and, and those who had been working on carbon sequestration had, had realized. Um, it, and so the, there was a sense that cap and trade, uh, as it was envisioned when they were uh, initially putting together the market, uh, wasn't uh, realizing everything that those uh, those folks had, had envisioned. And the following year, subsequent years, there was a collapse in, in the market. And I, I did some research to, to see some of the market forces. I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm, I'm not an international global uh, business person, but I, I began to find out and understand and realize that a number of factors played into that. In addition to uh, some cyber hacking of certificates for uh, uh, cap and trade uh, carbon sequestration. That's a whole nother story. But the point is um, the following year when I came back, uh, the market collapsed and cap and trade was not a viable option at that point. However, I didn't lose hope. I knew that at some point in the future, there is going to be uh, sectors that are unimaginable. There are gonna be things in the future that are going to take new and emerging science and I happened to have um, some interesting conversations while I was in Poznan, on Poland. I had some discussions with folks out of Dow Industries, for example, in Europe. And, and I explained to them, if you want to see a system from glacier to ocean where there's no development, I welcome you to the Cornell Nation because you'll find that. You'll find, a, you'll find economic and, or, and ecological conditions that you don't have to put together in, in a laboratory. You can come out and see it naturally. And so I was able to form... Uh, those type of relationships. But in the end, I thought, I'm going to continue to do the public policy work that's important. I'm going to continue to hold out hope that science and the massive investments that the U.S. is making into uh, technology and research is going to bring about sectors that we can't even think about at this, at this moment in 2009. And, and so um, I, I began to understand that there's, there's, there's hope. And uh, right now, in, in this current time, uh, there are things I, I've been invited to work with Porterra 
on working on things like uh, cross laminate timber, building multi uh, story buildings without uh, steel and metal, but with cross laminate timber that sequesters carbon. Those are the kind of things that I think are, are in the future. And there, there's a whole litany of, of other things that are new and emerging. Uh, Quinault Nation is having to relocate our village to higher ground because of sea level rise. And we are creating uh, quite a diverse portfolio of things to do in our new village to become carbon neutral in our, our new uh, headquarters, the Quinault Nation. We are incorporating biomass, we are incorporating solar, we are incorporating cross laminate timber. And if I had a chance at this point in, in 2020 to have a conversation with a leader that I, I was in 2006 and meeting with the elders and for the first time hearing about uh, the, the massive uh, decline of our prized sockeye and, and to face that mountain and to witness personally a glacier that had, was completely gone and disappearing off the face of the planet and uh, a, a young leader in an international engagement around uh, new economies, around new and emerging science. If I had a chance to just have some time with that tribal leader, I would be telling that person, that leader back then, that there is going to be an, uh, an apocalyptic uh, coming together of your worst nightmare. You are going to be facing a global pandemic. You are going to be facing wildfires, mega fires, where they're not just uh, once every 10 years or every 20 years. You are going to be witnessing six consecutive years of mega fires. You are going to be witnessing uh, hurricanes and tornadoes that are going to just completely wipe out entire regions. Uh, up and down the eastern seaboard, in the Gulf of Mexico, you're going to see the entire west on fire, and you're going to see a global pandemic where everyone is going to be sheltered in place. Now, that would be a scary conversation. Uh, it, it, it's a scary reality that we live in. But I would also advise that leader to hold true to those values, to not become apathetic or, or don't succumb to fear and uncertainty and doubt. Do not uh, go to that place. And, and in the midst of a time in an era where there's so much social, racial, and political unrest, where there's so much division, where we are facing multiple apocalyptic challenges all at once in the year 2020, there are some things that haven't changed. And those things that have not changed are basic fundamental principles like traditional values like new and emerging science, the science that is going to lead us on that path to a brighter, more prosperous, more sustained and balanced future. I firmly believe that that future awaits us. I firmly believe that these times have brought us together in a place and a moment where we can look, search deep within our hearts and our soul to find it, those things that we can embrace those things that are ancient, that are timeless, that are real, that are meaningful, and that are proven to uh, be successful in, in helping us get through these apocalyp apocalyptic times. And there is no question in my mind that across sectors, and it doesn't matter what politics you come from, I know leaders in the Republican Party, I know leaders in the Democratic Party, I know leaders in the faith-based community, I know leaders in colleges and universities. I know business leaders. I know leaders who are working, uh, who have traditionally been working on things that are very carbon intensive, and they are having board meetings on how can we shift and adjust and move toward a more equitable, just, and sustainable future. I know all across the world, those conversations are happening. And so now is the moment and now is the time for us to embrace this very sacred moment. This moment of all of these challenges are designed to, to build our resilience, to show us just how strong we truly are, and to really show us who our partners and allies are. And if you search, it doesn't take much to search. You're gonna find allies and leaders in every sector. And it's up to our generation because no one is immune from climate change and everyone is so deeply impacted. And it is a, a glacial tsunami that has been coming at us for centuries. And, and this is our moment. And if we don't 
make the right decision. And if we don't make the right adjustments, it will only get worse. And, and I've long predicted that uh, the impacts of climate change are only going to increase in both intensity and frequency. And that is the one thing I knew back then. I just had no idea what it would mean to so many people, to our national economy, to our public health. And that is the, the last and final point I want to make in these remarks, that the opportunity that lies right in front of us is pretty significant. And if you consider the depths of all of the challenges and what it's done to completely destroy our economy uh, here in the state, as well as nationally and globally, as well as 200,000 people who have succumbed to COVID-19 at this moment, this last weekend. And, and if you consider all of those things, there's, there's also a mirrored hope and opportunity. We have an opportunity to rebuild our public health care system. We have an opportunity to rebuild our economy here uh, in the Northwest, across the country, and globally. And so when we sit down and put our best and our brightest minds together for a public health care recovery plan and an economic recovery plan, I am positive and I am certain there's going to be plenty of opportunity to, to develop those things that unimaginable future that we know exists. I can't quite articulate uh, the fine points of what an, an economic recovery health, um, plan might look like or even a public health care recovery plan, but I do know that we have a path. I do know we have a brain trust in this country and, and in this region to put together those technologies that are gonna be proven results. We have no other options and failure certainly is not an option, but here in the Pacific Northwest, we are so incredibly rich in our brain trusts. When you consider the indigenous peoples that have been here from when time began, that timeless, ancient, traditional, ecological knowledge that is in my community in the 29 tribal nations that are strong here in the state of Washington, every tribe has elders and has oral tradition and rich science and rich stories. That is priceless. And then when you consider the, the, the businesses that we have in our region, when you consider the economy, when you consider those who are public policy leaders like Governor Inslee in, in our state, when you consider all of the different sectors, the University of Washington and, and the rich uh, tradition that they have in, in ad advising and informing public policy decisions here in the Pacific Northwest, that is the type of vision that we, we can see seven generations out, like my ancestors have done so often, but we have to come together. And it is in moments like this, and it is opportunities like this, and I am so grateful to our insurance commissioner for inviting me to this event. And I, I want to continue to put out invites to anyone and everyone who is willing to directly engage with the Quinault Nation, with the National Congress of American Indians or other tribal nations here in the Pacific Northwest. We are doing some exciting things. There's some incredible opportunity and challenges, but together I'm confident we are going to rise above this burning political, economic, and environmental uh, storm, these apocalyptic challenges, to not only embrace them and become more resilient, but is, it is by design there to make us stronger it is there by design to force us to search deep within our mind and within our spirit so we can access all of the knowledge, all of the strength, all of the resolve to truly meet today's challenges. And I am confident we are going to do it. So stay up well, my hands are raised to you. Thank you and uh, best wishes for an exciting conference. Thank you, President Sharp. We're taking virtual questions in the chat area and on our LinkedIn event page posted in the comments section. Visit the page later to view answers, ask additional questions, and join in the discussion.